Okay, welcome everybody to the final session of today. This is going to be a little bit more um, easygoing and lighthearted, or at least that's what I asked Tom to, to do. Um, now, Tom's doing fantastic research and interesting work in restoration, which he's been working on since his work in Yale. Before Yale, he, was, uh, he did his PhD at Cardiff University in Wales. Um, he did a postdoc in Yale where he started getting interested in forest restoration activities. Um, and then went on to the Netherlands Institute of Ecology in Wageningen, um, in the Netherlands, obviously, um, uh, where he, from which he uh, subsequently moved to ETH just very recently, just about six months ago, maybe more than six months ago in October uh, last year, uh, to join ETH as a professor in our department of global ecosystem ecology. Um, now, after Tom's talk, we're going to have... Uh, just another panel discussion um, with, I think, Robin, Manuel, um, and Doug McGuire, who's there. Um, and maybe, Tom, if you wanted to join that, that would be great. And that's going to be facilitated by Chris Kettle, um, who's working and has worked um, at ETH for about 10, 11 years or so, but is now working in biodiversity and has got a part-time position also still at ETH. So I'll ha be able to hand over, and I can truly relax for the day, I'll be able to hand over to Chris later on. But for now, Tom... Go ahead. Perfect. Thanks very much. Can people hear me on this? Nice. Okay. So, yes, we've recently started our lab um, essentially exploring global scale ecological processes in the hope that we can better improve our understanding of climate change and our ability to, to address it by improving the management of natural ecosystems in the fight against global change. So, the pr primary a main chunk of our research is focusing on this, the carbon cycle. This is a NASA simulation of carbon dioxide movement throughout the year. And you can see high concentrations indicated by the red colors in the northern latitudes in the early parts of the year. As time ticks on and we move towards late spring and early summer, you can see the emergence of leaves on trees draws down that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, converting the red into yellows and then blues. This is a very well-known and incredibly large ecological process, one of several that govern the global carbon cycle, and in doing so, they regulate the climate. Um, in contrast, I mean, a few months later, carbon emissions from the soil and decomposition will release a lot of that carbon back into the atmosphere, continuing this cycle. But in contrast, human emissions are relatively small. We can see them located around some of the, the urbanized areas apart, uh, around the world. These human emissions are relatively small, but they're not balanced out by anything. So obviously climate change is happening. And I think it's a really sort of uh, meaningful and honorable um, goal to be able to, to use natural ecosystems, given the magnitude of those fluxes, given the magnitude of their impact on the global carbon cycle, I think it's certainly our, one of our best strategies possible to be able to use and manipulate natural ecosystems in the fight against global change. If we can enhance uptake by natural ecosystems, by restoring and developing natural systems, that's certainly one of our best uh, strategies in the fight against climate change. The problem is the Earth system is a highly complex system. And if we affect it or alter it without really understanding what we're going to do, what the, the implications are going to be, it could be quite dire. Um, several examples, many, there's thousands of examples of restoration efforts gone wrong. One classic example is the eradication of, of sparrows in China. Uh, the sparrows were widespread across the country, and they thought that they were, you know, consuming a lot of crops, uh, killing all the sparrows, across, killing hundreds of th hundreds of millions of sparrows across the country. Uh, actually simply reduced the top-down pressure on all the invertebrates, which then demolished all of the, the crops. Crop yields fell dramatically, and this is one of the major things that contributed to the great Chinese famine, killing over 30 million people. Uh, so land management decisions gone wrong there, or at least ecosystem management decisions gone wrong. Another example, culling of, of African elephants. Uh, the African elephant was supposed to be contributing to des desertification in Africa, so they killed 40,000 African elephants. And a desertification got a lot worse. And that's because, as we now know, elephants are important ecosystem engineers. They dig holes that provide nutrients and water for other animals. They produce feces that provide structure and soil quality for other, uh, other organisms within the ecosystem. And they're important for maintaining those natural ecosystems. And this obviously happens with, with forest restoration, too. Um, there's ample examples, of, lots of examples of restoration efforts where trees fail to grow or, or to fail to establish. But there's also examples where they've gone drastically wrong. Large-scale restoration in China has, you know, in, the, in the early 2000s had fantastic impacts on carbon sequestration in many parts of the country. Uh, but in some, of the, some other parts of the country, restoration was taking place in, in soils that couldn't sustain forests. So 
Uh, these could be either too dry or nutrient depleted, or they didn't have the microbiota that was uh, in the soil available to support forests. And what we saw is that most of those trees died, and the death of those trees actually contributed to uh, soil erosion and uh, the depletion of soil nutrients and resources, leading to the loss of carbon and nutrients from those soils. And obviously, we've seen it in Northern Europe as well, where over, you know, hun hundreds of years of replacing uh, northern hemisphere forests with uh, fast-growing spruce and pine species, which are now in place of what would naturally be deciduous species, has led to a reduction of albedo, and that is, this has drastically warmed the climate. We've seen that replacing light-colored deciduous trees with dark-colored coniferous trees has drastically altered the climate in the opposite direction that we were aiming for. So restoration... Obviously, it's, it's all very well, well intended. There's lots of uh, good and honorable goals in it. But what we really need is basic global scale information so that we can unify our efforts and make sure that we're all moving in the same sort of direction. We need to understand where are the best places to restore, how, uh, how do we best restore in those regions, and what impact will they have. We need to understand something about the impl implications, the impact of, that research, of those restoration efforts before we go to Gung Ho. The reason I got started on this research line was several years ago when I was working at Yale. Um, I was connected with an organization called Plant for the Planet, and they run the UN's Billion Tree Campaign. So they were planting a billion trees to save the world. Uh, the problem was they didn't know if a billion trees was a lot or a little, because we didn't know how many trees there were to start with. So the impact of a billion trees could have been ma massive or, or, or minor. We didn't really know. So I decided to, I, I got connected with them, and I thought I'd do a bit of background reading and just see what information we do have about the, the current state of the world's forest, how many, just a basic understanding of how many trees there are. I thought it would be a very brief study. Um, but I realized that something that characterizes our understanding of global scale ecology is that we just rely overwhelmingly on, on satellite data. There's obviously MODIS and satellite layers and information about spectral reflectance and, and canopy cover that is really, really valuable. But what we do is we just take layers of satellite information, and then we pile on other layers of satellite information, and we make new layers of, satel of modeled satellite information, and then we use them to model new models, and it just sort of goes around in circles. And we know lots of sort of modeled characteristics of the ecosystem without actually knowing what's going on below the surface. So in my naivety, I thought, well, we just need a little bit of ground source inf information, and so I started contacting academics and, and researchers around the world who might have done on the ground stem density estimates. I just wanted a load of estimates of tree density from around the world, so I could say, in these parts of the world, there's lots of trees, and in these parts of the world, there's not many. And we ended up collecting lots of de stem density estimates from all over the world, and eventually collected lots of the, uh, the main national forest inventories, which ended up providing us with over 400,000 plots. So we collected far more than I was ever expecting to. But with this information, we then had reasonably good coverage of the global forest system. Obviously, we're massi missing massive chunks in the tropics, obviously the hardest places, some of the hardest places to collect data from, but still, we still have in the tens of thousands of, of data points across the tropics, and obviously hundreds of thousands across the northern hemisphere. And with this huge coverage of all the, all the world's forested regions, we can then start to predict spatial patterns within the global forest system about how many trees there are in all the different parts of the world. So we use a very simple process that, I use, that we use throughout a lot of our research. We take data from lots of places. We pair it up with satellite information or, or global scale information on soil, climate, geology, topography, and, and, and obviously a lot of satellite spectral information. And we then generate, a, uh, and we use that information to generate spatial, spatially explicit models, models that can help us to understand the uh, the, the variables, the drivers of those environmental patterns, and, and that, well, that will allow us to interpolate between those dots to fill in all the locations. And the more information we have, the stronger those predictions get. So it started out using linear models and then quickly moved to basic machine learning models. Uh, whichever algorithms come out best, we use those algorithms to understand the drivers of those, of those forest patterns and predict them into the other areas. And by doing that, by interpolating or extrapolating those, that data across, uh, across the global forest system, we can come up with a very basic model of global tree density. And this is very useful because it tells us within every pixel, with every kilometer size pixel, it approximates how many trees there are in each of those pixels, and it can help us to understand inf uh, basic information about how many trees there are in each of the main biogeographic parts of the world. By adding up all of the pixels, we can then see that there are approximately three trillion trees on Earth. And obviously, this uh, was of interest to a lot of non-scientists. 
particularly the Billion Tree campaign, because it really put their efforts in context. If you imagine each of these trees that I've drawn here is a, uh, represents a billion trees, the addition of another billion was going to be great, but nowhere near the impact that they were hoping for. So they called it the Trillion Tree Campaign. And now they're going to save the world by planting a trillion trees across the world. And it's certainly going to have the, the magnitude of the impact they're hoping for. And while it sounds a bit like lofty goals, like ambitious thinking, since, they've start, since that study came out, they've already restored over 14 billion trees, effectively. These are, these are trees that have been monitored and, and, and evaluated several years after planting, not just number of trees planted. So they've had a lot of, of unsuccessful ones as well, but a lot of successful restoration efforts. And they're m amplifying their efforts all the time to aim for this lofty new goal. So just having meaningful understanding of what their targets should be has really allowed them to amplify their efforts. But obviously, this map of tree density doesn't just tell us where trees are. It, it tells us how many trees are being lost each year. We can overlay maps, you know, time la uh, temporal layers of, of forest cover to identify how many trees are lost each year. And we can approximate how many trees could be restored within the IUC and IUCN's restoration areas just to come up with large-scale general goals about how many trees could be restored and where they could be restored. But obviously, the map of tree density, from my perspective, isn't just about the number of trees. But by far the most important feature of this is that it tells us a really prominent feature of habitat structure that doesn't come from satellite information. It's ground-sourced information, and it tells us about the density of trees in those locations around the world. If you look, these two pictures represent regions that have similar latitudes, and they look very similar from space. The, the satellite spe spectral imagery looks very similar from space. But you can see this part is red, and this part is in a, in a sort of greeny area. And it indicates that the tree density is, is, in, is very strongly different. And anyone who's walked through a forest, an open or a closed canopy forest, can tell that a closed canopy forest and open canopy forest are very different in terms of the understory vegetation that live there, the plants and animals that can live there. And the, way that, and the way nutrients and elements are recycled within those ecosystems are very, very different. So it's just one feature of ecosystem one ecosystem characteristic that can help us to better understand the forest structure around the world. And for that reason, it's been used in various species distribution modeling efforts and biodiversity, pattern, uh, biodiversity modeling efforts. And it's also being incorporated into some of the large-scale sort of carbon cycle models, like the one I mentioned at the very beginning, in the my very first slide. So... This basic ground-sourced information at a global scale paired up with satellite information can start to get us an understanding of the basics of the forest, global forest system. But obviously, stem, dens stem density is only one feature of ecosystem structure that we care about. Uh, we're also interested. So we've, we've gone back to our raw data set, and we've sort of continued to build on it. And we're not just sticking with stem density. We now have basal area and the species identity for every single tree within our plots. And we've expanded our plots to about 1.2 million locations around the world. So we're really getting a really strong global coverage of the global forest system. Again, trees that have been individually identified by humans and uh, counted on the ground. So it's real information that can be easily paired up with satellite data. And with this GFBI information, the first thing we did was to address a question that kept coming up. Uh, again, I'm working with this with the Plant for the Planet, and they essentially coordinate thousands of other restoration efforts around the world. And they kept being asked, should we be restoring monocultures of the most productive species, or should we be restoring naturally diverse communities? So the very first thing we, we wanted to do was evaluate this. There was a lot of theory suggesting that biodiversity has a, product, uh, uh, a positive impact on productivity, but it was never tested at a global scale. So using our simple, you know, uh, from each of those plots, we have information about the number of species, and we have information about the productivity of those, of those plots over time, the change in the volume of those stems. And we could see that clearly by sampling and resampling 10,000 times across the world, we can see consistently that there was, across the global forest system, a very nice continuous increase in productivity as you increase the number of species in those samples. A very basic sort of discovery. But by doing it in a spatially explicit way, we could see in which parts of the world diversity is most important for maintaining productivity. So we could say, you know, in the yellow parts, Maybe in the, in, the, in the Amazonian tropics, there'll be hundreds, maybe 200 species per hectare. So the loss of one species might not have such a drastic impact. Whereas in the northern boreal Canada, there'll be only three or four species. Losing one of those species will have a, a, a greater impact on productivity. And we can come up with a spatial map of the importance of, of species diversity for, for maintaining productivity. And the theory, the concept behind it is very simple. Different species have different strategies for capturing water and nutrients and light. 
uh, whereas sim monocultures of the same species compete for those resources in exactly the same way. Therefore, they clash, and they're less effective, less efficient at capturing those en that energy, and they, and they grow less, less productively. And the, pro the consequence of this is uh, we, we sort of tied it into um, the sort of financial value of forest biodiversity. So there was an est I think uh, somebody had estimated that the value of forests globally for timber, pulp and paper, and forestry industry at a global scale was somewhere in the order of $14 billion. I mean, this was, there was a huge amount of uncertainty around that number, but it's in that sort of order. So using that number, if we were then to scale the entire global forest into a monoculture of the most productive species, Simply in terms of forest volume, the productivity of that would go down to $200 billion a year. So it was a loss of an annual loss of $200 billion simply if we were to be restoring monocultures as opposed to restoring uh, or converting diverse forests into monoculture forests. So it sort of puts a financial value on the value of diversity. So that shouldn't be so blue. The, the, the turquoise bit should be white, but this is uh, essentially the symbol for the new trillion tree campaign. So this is. Uh, the new, more ecologically informed trillion tree campaign that has been run by Plant for the Planet. And there's also an equivalent, uh, WW, uh, an equivalent, I think it's trillion trees, uh, I think having the S differentiates it from the trillion tree campaign. There's a trillion trees campaign too, led by WWF, uh, World Conservation Society, and BirdLife International. And so the first one is trying to add a trillion new trees, the second one is trying to restore, maintain, uh, and grow, uh, and contribute to adding a trillion new trees. Um, and they have the basic goals that we know that there's the potential for approximately a trillion or somewhere over a trillion new trees within the, the IUCN's restoration areas. They know the magnitude of their efforts that they have to aim for, and they know that they can't just be restoring monocultures of species. These are the basic guidelines that they're now going by. Now, obviously, these guidelines, the, the, the more detailed guidelines are going to vary drastically for all the different parts of the world. And so that's the next step. Our research goals at the moment are moving towards trying to get that roadmap for all those restoration organizations around the world in different parts of the world. So we're not just aiming at the tropics. We're not just aiming at any part, particular location. We want to come up with unified basic information that can serve as general guidelines so that people can understand these three questions, where should we be restoring, how we should be restoring, and what the impacts are going to be on the climate. So again, what we're doing is we're going back to this GFBI data set with our data on forest structure and canopy uh, and basal area and species identities through time from all of, all of these locations. And we're generating spatially explicit models. Again, we're interpolating between those locations so that we can get basic information. And then we interpolate it within the global forest system. This is the, uh, Matt Hansen's global forest cover map. Um, and we interpolate those models within, the, within, within that area to come up with high-resolution high spatially explicit maps that tell us things about the productivity of the forests around the world. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in this model, but we can see if globally, if you're going to target restoration efforts, obviously we all know you, you aim for the tropics where you get far higher productivity. This is again only focusing on uh, basal area, so this is the, the, the stem volume growth, but still we can identify regions that have the highest potential productivity. And what we're doing is now we're combining that basal area information with allometric equations from all of these regions to identify biomass change. So we can actually identify if you're going to be aiming in any particular locations of the world, these are the, the, the sort of potential growth um, values that we could be aiming for, if they are equivalent to the current ex existing forest, um, forest values. Uh, and I should mention, we're also pairing that up a lot with, uh, again, with remotely sensed information about albedo. But this albedo data can be, we're, we're sort of allowing ourselves to rely more heavily on the remotely sensed information with albedo, given that albedo is measured as light reflectance from the surface. And what we want to do is ultimately come up with an information about, for any location around the world, how much carbon is stored there and how much heat is being retained within that forest. So you can really say how much the, that forest is contributing to greenhouse gas emissions and how much it's contributing to heat storage. Um, but then the how, I think, comes down to basic information about the forest structure. So we can say already basic information about the, the, the structure of the forest in terms of tree density. We can say what possible tree densities might be, might be reached and evaluated uh, uh, at different parts around the locations around the world. We're providing information about st species richness. Obviously, this is just the number of species in a location. And you'll see the whole northern hemisphere in this map is indicated as a, as a purple. But that's simply because anything below sort of 11 species is all covered, is all purple. So anywhere from the sort of temperate region up until the boreal region is going to be very low. It's because the color ramp has to be stretched so much because there are so many species down in the tropics. <coughs> 
Um, but again, you can now, based on, you know, if you're doing restoration in the high, highest latitudes, you can identify basically the, 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 within an order of magnitude the type, the number of species that would be great to aim at if you're doing these basic, simple forest restoration strategies. Um, and what we're also focusing on now is, is trying to get an understanding of what's going on in the soil. So we know that forests around the world associate with different mycorrhizal and um, fungal and bacterial symbionts that allow them to grow. And those forests have different, different tree species, will have different symbioses, and they'll have different com soil communities that will allow them to persist. So again, we can give information about the types of soils that can be supporting the different types of species. So we can identify that arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi dominate in the tropics and the lower latitudes, whereas ectomycorrhizal uh, forests will dominate in the high latitude regions. So if you're planting EM fungi down in the tropics, you're not going to get as much success as you'd hope for. And we've also got spatially explicit information about mycorrhizal, I mean uh, nitrogen fixing, bec uh, I shouldn't say the word mycorrhizal there, nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, and then the final step is that we're, again, we've been do make, doing all these maps within the current forest system, and the plan is now, we've been taking our GFBI data and, uh, and also pairing it up with um, sort of valorized um, information from, uh, from people who have actually sort of zoomed in on local locations around the world so we can get an actual uh, human identification of forest coverage from locations all around the world. And these locations cover everything from drylands all the way up to tropics and boreal forests across all ecosystems. We've collected about 60,000 locations from, um, from, restoration, from conserved conservation areas around the world where there's been minimal human influence. And by doing that, it allows us to generate those spatially explicit um, maps again where we can model tree density, or fo sorry, uh, forest coverage based on environmental characteristics. And that allows us to predict how many trees there would be if we didn't have human influence. And so again, this is a completely unrelated to, f to satellite information. This, is, this, this model is is based on zero satellite information, purely scaled up based on uh, soil and, hu and uh, climate data. We can estimate where forests could potentially be, and given all political and social constraints, we can give guidelines as to how much canopy cover could exist in different regions around the world. And that's very much ongoing work. So that just leaves me to thank the lab and all the amazing people that do this work, uh, and to thank all of our funders for supporting the global scale research. So, that's one. Thanks. So I'm going to, before we start the, oh, I'll let you take over, in fact. I'm just going to let Tom have a, in case there are a few questions for Tom. Sorry? That's what I was thinking, yeah. So if there's any questions to Tom, um, we'll spend a few minutes doing that, and then we can have a general panel to discuss all kinds of different things, whatever you want coming from today. Um, and I'll let you moderate this, because I want to sit down and listen. You're getting tired. Lawrence. Thank you for the beautiful talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Hey, what you have is forest plots in managed areas and you have mature forest plots. And now you want to use this information to give recommendations for restoration. And those conditions of those restored, that areas that have to be restored are totally different. It's degraded soils, impoverished. So to what extent can you translate your mature forest knowledge towards the harsh environmental conditions that you need to improve by starting succession with pioneers. So I didn't, I didn't fully hear that. Could you? Okay, your plots. Yeah. Uh, are we talking about the GFBI plots or, yeah. the, or the final one that I showed? Your GFBI plots. They're ah, mostly yeah. in either in uh, managed forest for timber yeah. or they are in mature forest. Now you give recommendations to plant trees. So to what extent can you translate your findings for mature forest towards barren areas where you have to plant trees? experience hot conditions, impoverished soil conditions. So how are you going to make that translation step? I think that the sort of premise of the question, I, I mean, it's a very, definitely a, a good thing to consider. And we're not going, we haven't spent enough time thinking of going into details of the actual forest age at this point. We're, we're planning to generate a map of the forest age so we can understand that. But the premise of the question is that most of our, our data is from managed and, and mature forests. And that's actually the opposite. We've got overwhelming majority of our data comes from from, from, from poorly managed forests or, or, or either regrowth forests or new growth forests. So the stem densities can be really, really high. It's, it's predominantly regrowing forests. There's very few old growth forests in there. It's only a 
less than 5% we think are about our, our old-growth forests. So what all we say, all this information, is not, it's not sort of guiding information about, um, about forest regeneration or the timing of regeneration or the, or the processes that are going, or, the, or the phases that are going to be going through, through forest succession. We're basically saying, this is the current status that of, uh, based on the best data we have right now. If you could restore the world's forests to what we approximate in this uh, what we have approximately now, then this is the potential for restoration. Obviously, a forest isn't just a forest, and a tropical forest isn't just a tropical forest, and a mature one is much better than a, uh, than a new one. But we can't, using the information we, we've got at the moment, we, we haven't gone into that in amount of detail. But we do want to bring in this successional stage aspect as we get deeper and deeper into the data set. It's the early days right now. Oh, I don't do the forest restoration. <laughs> I just encourage them. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, they, there's there's thousands of restoration projects that are working with the the Trillion Tree campaign, and they all have their different uh, their different suppliers and different. You know, it's it, someone in Costa Rica will go to a seed bank, or I, I don't know. They'll get their forests, their, their trees from somewhere else in Costa Rica, I guess. And that we obviously we we give some basic guidelines like promoting. Uh, diverse communities and promoting native species and promoting, but these guidelines are getting, and, and the nice thing is that we work very closely with them so we can keep refining these guidelines, but at the moment they're very general, so we don't really tell them where to get their trees from. Yeah. Maybe we can follow that one up in the panel discussion. I think that's a rather important point. <laughs> Uh, yes, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, so if your um, aim is also to look at the effect of uh, forest restoration for climate mitigation, um, so I think it would be interesting at some point, I guess you already include a lot of things, but just uh, as an idea to, to, to do in the future, maybe to uh, include um, transpiration because the... Uh, we know now more and more that the trees interact with the water cycle, and so it will be really interesting to combine this tree density um, information with actual transpiration and see uh, how these different uh, restoration potential affect also the, the, the water cycle. I absolutely couldn't agree more. Yeah, I think, you know, main impacts that forests will have on the climate carbon cycle, water cycle, and albedo. And so at the moment, we've got people doing carbon and, and, and albedo, and I'm really keen to get that third layer in there, definitely. So encourage all postdocs to apply to work in our lab. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. Um, so, um, your work is very global in scope. Um, I'm wondering what about downscaling these kinds of approaches to make them amenable for forest planning or restoration? Yeah, at the moment, the data set that we've got is so, it's so glo it, you know, it can provide broad scale, broad scale biogeographic patterns. But what we want to do is see how relevant the, the, the mechanisms and drivers that we've got are at the local scale. So that's one of the first sort of steps that we're doing in Switzerland, because there's such amazing inventory data, forest inventory data. We're going to be sort of from now on well, building towards doing a, a combined global and, local and national scale approach so we can see if the drivers are the same, the mechanisms are similar, and we can figure out where the difference between the national scale and the, and the global scale information is. But yeah, at the moment, I, it's very difficult to give very targeted local information. It's, it's more so, so sort of speaking to Plant for the Planet and saying, right, we've got $10 million. Should we give it to someone in Canada or give it to someone in Mexico? It's sort of broad scale <coughs> guidelines. But yeah, that's where we, another area we'd like to move into, having more fine scale information. Okay. What about the... Oh, sorry, Robin. I think Barbara was... No. Oh, sorry. Okay. What about the option of, rather than planting the trees, but uh, creating conditions for them to reestablish naturally? Have you thought of that as Plant for the Planet, thinking about that at all? Yeah, they do. I think there's more of that than planting, actually. I think the, the planting is just a... It's more for for people, you know, it's more to get people involved. It's a very much for, to sort of like get children supporting the mission, but I think the vast majority is actually allowing natural restoration. Because again, that's the first thing I said when, and the first thing every restoration, every one says to them when they say, how do we best do this? You just say, oh, leave it alone, take the sheep off, or, or restore the soils, or, yeah, so there's a lot, they, they are very much in favor of doing that. But obviously the, the tree planting is the way to get people into it, and, and they want to promote, 
human, like people's involvement in, in, in restoration. So it's sort of, they're, they're using a combined approach. And definitely w, the WWF one, I mentioned the two trillion tree campaigns. The WWF one is much more involved, much more committed to the sort of natural regeneration angle. Okay, so Barbara and then Manuel. Barbara. Thank you. I was absolutely fascinated. In one of your slides, there was a significant difference between the different tropical forest zones. I think in Africa, it's much less productivity, if I remember correctly, the parameter, than in the Amazonia and in Asia. Exactly. That's one oh, of yeah, the pictures. One. Yeah. Um, no. How do you explain that difference, and how do you draw conclusions from that for your project? I don't believe it. I think the model needs to be improved. It's not published yet, and it's several steps along the way, and I don't believe it for a second. And it may, I mean, maybe it is right, and maybe we haven't included information about, you know, this is just the, the basal area of the plot, so the, the, the sort of productivity in terms of area, but what, we'd like, what we need to do is incorporate information about stem density, maybe the maybe you know, allometric equations and scaling things up to biomass are gonna be more informative, but I certainly wouldn't yet want to put my hat on the fact that African forests are less productive than Amazonian forests. Um, again, this is, yeah, these, all the, the, the latest maps I showed are sort of in the process of being, of being developed, and I was quite surprised to find that myself. In fact, also in, you know, we know that the sort of Washington state area and the, the sort of north, um, northwest of um, the US is also a highly productive region, and this model's giving very low productivity, so we'll, we'll see, but there's, Lots of modifications to be done and, and, and model improvements to be done first <laughs> before I would like to make any comments on that. Thank you for your presentation. I haven't read your paper. This is a very basic question. What was the minimum diameter of the trees that Ten. you mapped? 10 centimeters. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's, it, we had to have a cutoff. At, yeah, but given most of the forest inventories that we had were around 10, that's the one we went with. I have a frivolous question, Tom, then. So um, in your estimates of the total number of trees on the planet, I was walking down the street in Kuching in China a few months ago and absolutely blown away by how many trees there were in the middle of the town. So could you give us a few words about how, how those kind of information are integrated into your estimate of total number of trees on the planet? That's a really good question because it talks not only about the importance of urban areas but also how important human perception is for these global scale models. So the, you're right, there's loads of trees in towns and we actually, we collected data on city population size and, comp and correlated it with number of trees in the cities and I think we had about 250 cities across the world and it's an incredibly strong correlation. It turns out m bigger cities have more trees but, but they, we, we, were, we were able to get really strong like point, R squared of 0.8 or 9 for predicting cities. And then it turned out we spent ages and ages compiling that data and ages and ages putting it together, and it wasn't even one of the decimal places that we included in the final number. So it turns out it, may, it looks like there's lots of trees, but there's loads more not in, in cities. Yeah. And that's another thing. Like So many of these, after we published that data set, you can imagine we got so many emails from people saying, what are you talking about? I've seen there's 10 trees in the Vatican City. You're talking crap. But we had to just be like, yes. We, we also talk a lot about our uncertainties. And at the hectare scale, there'll be a huge amount of uncertainty. And it's when you aggregate to sort of 200 kilometer scale that, or 200 hectare scale that you get really strong average, average estimates. Again, this is talking about large scale, broad scale project projections, which aren't necessarily, as Debrou mentioned, perfect at the local scale. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Um, just so intrigued by your point that um, the public doesn't understand anything except tree planting. And I wonder what your personal thoughts are because. I mean, certainly UK forestry policy now, there's a sense that when people come on national radio and TV, especially politicians, they give the impression that um, forests wouldn't be able to survive if it wasn't for humans, that we are, kind of keep them going and we have to plant them, otherwise they won't exist, which is kind of to Robin's point about. Do, do you think that this obsession with promoting tree planting is justified or do you think that people just haven't made enough effort to explain that actually natural regeneration is uh, natural? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I'm all into natural regeneration. But I mean, I, I also have no problems with speeding the process along a bit if, it's, if, it is that, if that is what you're doing. And it also, again, depends on your end goals. The problem is some people are doing it to restore 
to restore water supply, water filtration to a, a community. Other people are doing it for another reason. You know, it's the, the, the targets vary between people, but generally it seems like allowing natural regeneration promotes biodiversity, definitely a lot better, promotes carbon storage uh, over time. It can take a little bit longer, it seems, but uh, I would argue if you can, you know, encourage human involvement in the process, then that has its own benefits. And so I definitely wouldn't be dissing tree planting at all. I think it's an amazing thing when you get 60,000 children planting trees. I think that's a huge thing for you know, the, the message. But yeah, as you say, natural regeneration is the way I would... It's the, I'm always sort of singing that one to them. That's my sort of main target audience. There's another question, yes. Thanks, Tom, for, for your presentation. I just noticed on the plot that there are actually so few in Africa relative to other places. So two things, how, what, what are your thoughts and how do we push that um, forward? And secondly, how then are you, how, what, what confidence levels do you have for the areas that are relatively very low in terms of the plot data that you have? Yeah, we generate our, our uncertainty. Well, I'll answer the second part. For, the first part is, you're right, there's not much in Africa and we're, always desperately trying to get more. I, it seems like we might be having a good avenue in going for um, sort of timber, you know, actual commercial companies that, are, that have financial interest in knowing where all the trees are and what's going on, and they do their own monitoring. And, and it seems like we might be getting somewhere along that lines to get a lot of Africa data, but we're, we're just always, always looking. The difficult thing is, in the big European, in the, you know, the places where we've got lots of data, it's because a, a country did a national forest inventory, and that data is either either hard to come by or non-existent in most of the Af most regions of Africa. So it's most of, every time we're, we're spending months trying to contact people, trying to encourage them that it's fine to share their data, trying to encourage them that they'll be part of this thing rather than being separate from it. And you can imagine how little people like to share their data, but then it ends up they go, okay, fine, you can have it. Here's two plots, and that's great because we've got two more plots, but it's it's difficult to fill out Africa. The uncertainty question is, a, is a one that we think a lot about. Of course, there's a huge amount of uncertainty with all these estimates. And what we do is, the problem is, we're using layers, each of which has their own layer levels of uncertainty, which are all propagated through the whole process. And we can't quantify all of that. But the way we calculate our uncertainty is we generate our spatially explicit models. We then use sort of like a K-fold cross-validation approach. So we use sort of, we, we take out 10% of the data, we run our model to see how well it predicts that 10% of the data, we then do it 10, 10 times. And then with those 10 models, we'll have 10 spatially explicit maps. We can then lay them on top of each other and calculate the standard deviation with each of, within each of those pixels. Then you can make a map of uncertainty. And as you say, it's always highest in the regions where we have the, the smallest amount of data. That turns out this is our science. More data we have, the better our predictions get. Um, so yeah, the, that's one of the main focuses of our, of our group. I think one, if it's a short question, then we'll move on to the panel discussion. Um, are they, what's the time frame for your plot data? Is it just a single census or does it span like a really long time period? I wish it was a single census, if they all just communicated and did it all at once. It's all about, I think it's about, it was about 11 years when I did my first study, but now we've, now it's gone up to, with some of the, some of the, for about several hundred thousand of the plots, we've got repeat measurement time, so we're trying to get it as long as possible. Uh, but on average, the, the sort of final time point stuff is about 15 to 20 years. So it is quite considerable. But again, one of the arguments we make is the, of course, it's, there's a, a huge amount of forest change during that time, thousand, millions and millions of hectares of forest. But it turns out, again, at the global scale, the amount of change each year is within a decimal place of the total forest stuff, uh, total forest estimates. So we can get reasonable. We're feeling like a 15 or 20 year difference isn't that bad at the global scale. Of course, we want more and better data always. OK. Thanks very much, Tom. Mm. I think we can keep the headset on if you want to, because um, I think oh. we're going to ask you to join the panel discussion. But if oh, you would yeah. like to take a seat, you can have a rest from the excellent presentation. Thanks. Thanks.